All right, so uh, urogynecology is a relatively new term. Um, a lot of people don't know, and I've just in the last couple of years, I've been figuring it out myself, so I want to share what I've learned about it with you. Um, <clears throat> it's a subspecialty that just in 2013 became a separate board recognized specialty. Uh, it's a subspecialty of obstetrics and gynecology. So briefly, um, I have been in practice in Mobile for 40 years. Uh, I did regular obstetrics and gynecology for many years. Stopped delivering babies in about 2003 and uh, limited my practice to gynecology, but then I started emphasizing this area of urogynecology, which we'll be talking about. When uh, in 2006, I limited my practice to doing nothing but urogynecology. And um, in 2013, when the board examinations became available for the first time, I uh, sat for the boards and passed them and have been doing exclusively urogynecology ever since. So basically, it's dedicated to the diagnosis and treatment of pelvic floor disorders. Pelvic floor disorders are caused by weakening in the pelvic floor muscles or ligaments, most notably resulting from childbirth. And you can kind of think about childbirth injuries, the majority of them are what we would call subclinical, meaning that you sustain an injury, but it goes unrecognized. You're not bothered by it. It doesn't cause any symptoms. But over time, it's kind of like when you, if, if, if any of you have sprained an ankle, you know that that ankle is never quite as strong as the other one. And if you're going to twist an ankle again, it always seems to be that same one. Well, it's the same thing here. The ligaments and uh, and fascial layers that support the pelvic organs get stretched or torn, and over time, the combined effects of gravity and strenuous activities make uh, these defects become symptomatic. There are other risk factors, notably hysterectomy, uh, obesity, physical activities that result in chronic increased abdominal pressure and or disorders like a chronic cough, uh, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease with coughing or chronic constipation where there's a lot of straining. So the, the most common problems that we see are related to either urinary incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, and or pain. Now, there, there are a lot of other things that we see, but that's really the bulk of it, and that's where I really want to focus my attention in the remaining of our time together today. First, let's look at normal pelvic anatomy. In this picture, you can see the arrow pointing to the vagina. It should be suspended between the bladder and the rectum so that the vaginal opening uh, is between the opening to the, uh, to the bladder, the urethra, and the rectal opening. There's a layer of fascia or strong connective tissue that's between the front wall of the vagina and the bladder, and that supports the bladder. There's another layer between the back wall of the vagina and the rectum that supports the rectum. So it's those layers that are the critical areas that are subject to, to damage with childbirth. Um, now, when we think about bladder function, the normal function uh, is, is, is marked by the bladder staying in a relaxed state until voiding is voluntarily initiated. So as the bladder muscle is relaxed, the pelvic floor muscles and the urethral sphincter muscle should be in a state of moderate to high tone to keep leakage from occurring. There are basically two uh, 
mechanisms of urinary incontinence that we see. And there are others, but you could say 99% of urinary incontinence falls into these two categories. One is an overactive bladder. And with overactive bladder, what happens is rather than the bladder staying in a state of relaxation, when it reaches a certain critical threshold of, fi of filling, uh, the bladder muscle, tr it triggers that bladder muscle and it contracts and it overpowers the resistance of the sphincter muscle and the pelvic floor muscles so that incontinence occurs. Overactive bladder is very common. It's age related. Uh, probably 50% of women in their postmenopausal years are going to experience some degree of overactive bladder. Fortunately, it's uh, it is easily treatable, and the majority of them respond to either behavior modification or drugs. The behavior modification are simple things like what we term time voiding or schedule voiding. With, as I mentioned, uh, when the bladder reaches a certain threshold of filling, that's what triggers it to, to contract. So with, with time voiding, the objective is to empty your bladder before it reaches that level of filling. So in women who have a ver fairly mild overactive bladder, they may be able to circumvent the whole problem by simply voiding before they get that sense of urgency. The urgency, when the urgency hits, then it's too late. So uh, that, that is a, a simple uh, way of doing behavior modification. The pharmacotherapy or drugs are the drugs that you frequently see on, advertised on TV. There's Vesicare, there's uh, Detrol, Mirbetric, uh, a lot of those medications. And they usually work well. Um, there are times, however, when they are not sufficient and then we go to what we call a third stage of uh, treatment, and that falls into two categories, either Botox injections or neural modulation. Everybody's probably familiar with Botox. You get it for treating wrinkles and all kinds of cosmetic things. Well, we use it in the bladder too, and that sounds really strange, but we take a a, a cystoscope where we look up inside the bladder and, and insert a needle through that and inject multiple sites in the bladder muscle itself. The objective is to partially paralyze that bladder muscle so it's not so irritable and <clears throat> can relax more. The side effect is if you inject too much then, then it, uh, you, you have difficulty voiding. So we have to kind of find the fine line between enough and not too much. But we get wonderful results with this. In women who are not responding to medications, we, we have had very good results. And uh, the, the injections will last for about six months, maybe as long as nine months. If the patient gets a good result, invariably they're happy to come back and do it again. We do that in the office. It takes about 15 minutes to do the whole treatment and uh, it's very little discomfort in doing it. The other area is neural modulation and that involves stimulating the nerves to the bladder with an electrode. Those electrodes can be placed through the back, through, through the sacrum, and there's a way to kind of find the nerves to the bladder. When it's positioned properly, then it's hooked up to a battery pack, kind of like a, a pacemaker. But the battery pack is implanted under the skin in the, in the buttocks area. And <clears throat> it can be very good uh, as well. We've used that in the past and have kind of, in my, in my practice, uh, I don't do it anymore because I've found that the Botox works better, it's less invasive, uh, you don't have all the hardware implanted, 
And there are times when women uh, want to have it remo have the hardware removed, and that's a little problem. They can't have MRIs with that in. So, bottom line, we found the Botox to be the way to go with that, and have been very happy with it. So the other type of incontinence is what's called stress incontinence, and that is the leakage of urine that occurs with a sudden increase in abdominal pressure, most notably coughing, sneezing, but other physical activities like jumping on a trampoline or skydiving. <laughs> um, so, and it is primarily a surgical problem. Uh, there are two types of stress incontinence. The most common is what we just refer to as an anatomical stress incontinence, and that just simply means that this area, the area right under the urethra doesn't have good support. If you go back and think about the ligaments that support the bladder, well, the distal, the far end of the bladder is where it narrows down to the urethra, and that has to have support as well. So if it lacks good support, then the stress incontinence occurs. And again, that is primarily a childbirth-related thing. We see a lot of stress incontinence in younger women in their 30s, 40s. Uh, age is not really a factor, although with age, it's liable to get uh, gradually worse. This picture is showing what we currently use for the treatment of stress incontinence. And this is called a midurethral sling. That is a, a thin strip of a synthetic material that rests under the mid portion of the urethra. So in the picture on the left, that's uh, introduced through the vagina, but the arms come out through puncture sites uh, in the abdomen right above the pubic bone. The picture on the right, same entry point, but the arms come out through the leg crease on each side. There are advantages to each, each of those approaches um, and you might be asking, what about mesh? Why, why are we still using mesh? When you hear, see all these advertisements on TV that are talking about mesh and all the problems with mesh, well, I think it warrants a little further explanation. There was a lot, of a lot of mesh products started being used. These sling operations that I just showed were introduced in 1998. A few years later, in roughly 2004, mesh products were used for the treatment of prolapse. And we'll, we're going to get into that in just a minute. But the objective was to support the pelvic organs with mesh because mainly the operations for pelvic organ prolapse have a notoriously high failure rate. So it's not uncommon to see patients who've had one after another, and eventually they just kind of give up. And a lot of patients we see never have come in. They, they wait until they have an advanced degree of prolapse because their mom had surgery and it didn't work and all kinds of things like that. Well, when the FDA started exploring all of this, they, um, they looked at all of the mesh products. Now, there were a whole host of, of these operations that had been introduced in, in roughly in 2004 for the treatment of prolapse, and they found that those were the main culprits. Those were the main uh, products that were causing the problems. As a result, all of those products have been taken off the market. As recently as April, uh, a few months ago, there were two, pr two of those products left on the market and they were removed from the market. So there are currently no uh, commercially available mesh products for the treatment of prolapse. The midurethral slings, on the other hand, when the FDA explored all of the complaints, they found that the slings were not a problem. As a result, 
uh, that has become the gold standard of what we do for the treatment of stress incontinence. Now there are other operations that used to be done and <clears throat> that still can be done, but the advantage to the midurethral sling places it in such a, um, such a position that most people don't, wouldn't even consider doing these other operations. And I'll elaborate on that in just a bit. There was one operation for prolapse called the sacral colpopexy, and it is a mesh repair of, for prolapse that has been done for probably 40 years. And interestingly, it was not affected. The FDA said, we're not seeing problems with that operation. So why use mesh for a midurethral sling when other treatments, these other treatments that it uh, replaced were, are available? And they were equally effect, effective. But the, but the problem was that they were abdominal procedures uh, requiring incisions, multiple incisions, longer operating time, general anesthesia, and m many more complications associated with them than with the midurethral sling. So now we can do an operation for stress incontinence that's minimally invasive, outpatient, local anesthesia and sedation, and the patients are literally in and out uh, in a couple of hours, and it, and it works immediately. It's not to say they, they can't have problems. Any surgical procedure can have problems, as you all know. And there are mesh-related problems, but the mesh-related problems associated with midurethral sling are few and far between, and in addition, they're easy to fix. So let's move on to talking about prolapse. Prolapse is the dropping of pelvic organs. In a female, the point of least resistance is the vagina. So anything that starts falling south is going to go through, work its way to the vaginal opening. In this picture, this is uterine prolapse. If the uterus, if a uh, patient has had a hysterectomy, then the top of the vagina would be coming down. This is showing, uh, prolapse of the back wall of the vagina. So what's protruding here is the back wall of the vagina with the rectum right behind it. And that's what's referred to as a rectocele. In this, the flip side, the front wall of the vagina is protruding down with the bladder right behind it. So when you hear people say their bladder's dropped, what they're actually saying is that the front wall of the vagina has lost its support, it's protruding, and has the bladder right behind it. And this is the um, top of the vagina. Hysterectomy has been performed, and in this case, instead of the top of the vagina being up suspended where it should be, it's dropping down. And it can, over the course of time, actually protrude through the opening as well. Most people, most women that have uh, symptomatic prolapse are going to co complain of a feeling of pressure in the vagina. And it's interesting that those symptoms don't normally occur until the level of prolapse reaches the vaginal opening. In other words, there can be a significant degree of prolapse that I would be able to see on a physical exam, but would never come to the attention of the patient until it reaches the vaginal opening. And it's at that point that the distension is, is noticeable and is perceived as a feeling of pressure. Um, as it progresses, then there can be external protrusion. And in its worst case, there's a total inside-out eversion of the vagina. The, the effects of prolapse uh, are, are uh, notable in 
bowel, bladder, and sexual function. So with, with a rectocele, for example, the, where the rectum is protruding or dropped, most women will have difficulty feeling that they have difficulty having a bowel movement. Vice versa, if the bladder's dropped, they may have difficulty uh, emptying the bladder. And frequently, there'll be an accompanying urinary incontinence that goes along with that. As far as the sexual uh, function, it varies. Sometimes it, it seems to bother more than others. There are non-surgical treatments for prolapse and there's surgical treatments. The non-surgical is one mode and that is a pessary. Most of you probably aren't familiar with pessary, but uh, you may be familiar with a diaphragm that was, that was commonly used for birth control a long time ago. I never hear about people using diaphragms anymore, but, but it works the same way. It's just inserted and just by virtue of its occupying space, it, it displaces the prolapse so that uh, the symptoms are resolved. Pessaries are, they've been around for, they've been around since before Christ. I mean, <laughs> uh, the Egyptians used pessaries, you know, they described putting pomegranates in the vagina and stuff like that. It, uh, I guess whatever works, huh? But um, I've, I don't find pessaries to be a good long-term solution. And I, I think it's not me, I mean, I th that's what my, my patients say. It can be a good short-term solution, and it can be real good for women who, for whatever reason, cannot undergo surgery. But in terms of the long haul, most women are not gonna be compliant with using this for years. Uh, and in addition, over time, it, they tend to cause a discharge and some irritation that can be pretty unpleasant. So that brings us into the surgical arena. Um, before I st start talking about this, there are, <clears throat> when we talk about surgery for prolapse, we can go one of two ways. We can go with a pelvic reconstructive procedure where the objective is to restore the that vagina and the vaginal support mechanisms to normal. Uh, the other is what we call an obliterative procedure. In el older women who are no longer sexually active and who've sworn that off, they, they may be interested in an obliterative procedure simply because it's a very simple procedure. It, the objective is to create one strong wall of support by approximating the front and back walls of the vagina. So it's essentially closing out the upper two thirds or so of the vaginal canal. And it's almost a fail safe operation. In other words, failures are as rare as hen's teeth on this. It's, it is a minimally invasive procedure so that women who have that can be out and about and resuming their normal activities literally on the next day. So there's a real appeal there, but obviously uh, it's a very select group of women who would, who would choose that. So the, the alternate uh, treatment is the pelvic reconstructive procedures. And we do this either with what we call a native tissue approach where we're not using any graft materials or, uh, or with a graft augmented approach where we put in mesh, for example, as in the sacral colpopexy that I'll show in just a second. So this is one picture where you can see the sutures right, right in this area are suturing the top of the vagina to a ligament that's deep in the pelvis. You can see here that that's the, the vagina, the rectum right behind it. 
And in this picture, it doesn't show the bladder, but it would be right in front of it as well. So the other way is a, what we would say is a graft augmented repair, and the graft being the mesh. Sacral colpopexy, as I said, is an operation. It's been around for at least 40 years. Initially, it was done without synthetic mesh. It was done using strips of fascia that were harvested either from the abdomen or the uh, leg and used as a bridge between the sacrum and the top of the vagina. So I don't know if you can see this pointer, but this mesh comes down and, it, and then it envelops the front wall of the vagina and the back wall of the vagina. And then it extends as a bridge up to the sacrum. It actually attaches to a ligament that runs right in front of the sacrum. It seems kind of strange when you think about it until you realize that the normal support mechanisms that were present uh, from birth on until later years was what we call uterosacral ligaments. And they were ligaments that ran from the uterus up to the sacrum. So in essence, you can think of the sacral colpopexy as a neo-ligament that duplicates that uterosacral ligament. It creates a normal physiological support mechanism. And I think that's one reason, one big reason why when the FDA ex examined all the complaints with MASH that they weren't finding problems with this because it's physiologic. Whereas the other products that had been introduced were creating support in ways that were not intended fr from the way we were created. They were uh, using other support mechanisms and they had problems. So <clears throat> elaborating a little bit more on the sacral colpopexy, we, we have found that when, when women come in with advanced prolapse, and let me digress a minute and just say, we talked about anterior anterior compartment, which is the cystocele, posterior compartment, the rectocele, and the apex, or the top of the vagina. Well, prolapse can come in any one or combination of those. So when there's a combination of all three, where the top of the vagina is down and the front and back walls are down, we find that the sacral colpopexy is the, the best. And that, uh, that impression is shared by, I would say, the majority of urogynecologists around the country who do this type of surgery. So why, you might ask, do surgeries fail? I've already mentioned that it's not uncommon to see women who've had a history of a prolapse repair. They say they had a bladder attack and it failed and they come back and have another one and on and on. Well, there are multiple reasons. Tissue strength varies from person to person, and research has actually shown that some women have better qualities of collagen than others. Uh, we don't fully understand um, the significance of all of that, but, but we know it happens. So there's some people that just don't have as strong tissues and they're more likely to fail. There are those who subject their repair to overly strenuous activity. Now with a good sacral colpopexy, for example, we say you can resume your normal activities, but at the same time, we tell them, you know, you probably don't want to do skydiving. And, you know, the more you do, the more likely it is over time that it's going to fail. Weight gain is another factor that uh, has an adverse effect on prolapse repair. And finally, the surgery, the initial surgery may not have been the best operation that could have been offered. And what we frequently see is that women, going back to the story about the bladder tack failing, well, that's all too common. In fact, some studies have shown that as many as 30% of women will fail their prolapse operation. 
But what we're finding is that a large majority of those fail because they had a, a weakness in the top of the vagina that was not addressed at the time of the surgery. So in other words, the, the bladder may have been tacked, supported, everything looked great, but if there's a weakness in the top, it, it's easy to understand how all the abdominal pressure is transferred to the weakest point and then it just starts pulling everything right back down. I mean, it's hard to, hard to believe, and I hate to, hate to see it, but we see patients not infrequently who've had an operation and they come back literally within a few months and they're right back where they started. And I think in the majority of those, it's simply because the, the right operation wasn't done to begin with. So going back to mesh and surgery using mesh, as you probably know, uh, mesh is widely used in hernia surgery, for example. And I'm the proud wearer of mesh for repair of a hernia, and it works great. I don't have any complications or any regrets. Mesh is not, uh, it's not harmful to the body, it's inert. Uh, you hear a lot of things to the contrary, but there's been no mesh that's been taken off of the market because it was defective. I say that, I think there may have been maybe one product, but, but the mesh itself is a safe product. Um, there are no rejections. There are no inf I've never seen an infection related to mesh. So we don't hesitate under the right circumstances to use mesh. Surgical complications happen and the majority of them are not mesh related. Obviously, if we use mesh, there become several things that are potential complications that are mesh related. And by and large, you could put those into two categories. You can say they, there's either a mesh exposure where the mesh was not implanted deeply enough under the tissue and, and, it, and it can be seen uh, through the vaginal wall or actually where it's eroded through the vaginal wall. In, that, in those cases, that's pretty easy to fix. The other, the other complication with mesh is pain-related complications where usually the mesh is, has come under too much tension and it creates pain. That's a bigger, that's a tougher problem and those are the problems that we had a lot of problems with with um, with these other products that were taken off the market. They had multiple arms that went out through various ligaments in the pelvis and when those arms started uh, getting tight and, and pulling against each other, it created a lot of pain. So in those cases, there are times when we, ha we go in and we take, take the whole thing out. Fortunately, with those being off the market now, we're seeing less and less of that, but, but those are the main problems. As a result, with the good experience that we've had with the, with the mid-urethral slings for incontinence, it's become widely accepted as the gold standard, meaning it's head and shoulders above the things that we used to be able to offer. And the sacral colpopexy has become the gold standard for advance uh, pelvic organ prolapse. Now, let me just qualify that. We don't do that many mesh prolapse procedures. We don't use, we don't do the sacral colpopexy that often for, um, for uh, pelvic organ prolapse, but we don't hesitate to use it in women who've got advanced prolapse where the top of the vagina is down and all the walls are, are down, and especially in women who've already had previous surgery. So the beautiful thing about using mesh for, for that operation is that it, when, you, when you're done with it, if you get a good result, you can count on keeping a good result. Same with the mid-urethral sling. They've done 
studies uh, that have followed women for as long as 17 years found no increased complications and the durability and effectiveness in controlling the stress incontinence doesn't, doesn't diminish at all. So bottom line, when mesh is indicated, it can be wonderful and we don't hesitate to use it in those circumstances. The, other, the third category that I wanted to uh, mention was this area of pelvic pain and dyspareunia, or dyspareunia being pain with intercourse. Pelvic pain is a common problem, and we see a, a fair amount of it, but there are a lot of, lot of causes for pelvic pain that don't involve us. But the, but the pelvis is a rich area for nerve innervation. You've got bowel function and bladder function and sexual function. And it's when you, when you think about all that goes on in the pelvis, it's, it's a very complex area of human anatomy. The thing that I want to just touch on is related to pain and problems secondary to estrogen deficiency. When in a menopausal setting or when, when a, a woman's not producing estrogen, it creates vaginal atrophy, which just means that that vaginal tissue becomes uh, ir irritated. Uh, uh, they, patients complain of dryness. Uh, they may have discharge. They may have bleeding. And inevitably, uh, they have discomfort with intercourse. Estrogen deficiency is the problem, and the treatment that I'm just going to talk about briefly is Mona Lisa Touch. That's a, I don't know why they chose Mona Lisa. <laughs> I think she looks sad in the picture, but I don't know. But anyway, um, but it's a laser treatment, it, and it, it actually is the same laser technology that's used for a lot of cosmetic surgery. It's called a fractional CO2 laser, and the way it works is it creates tiny little punctate burns through the surface uh, tissues, and the healing process brings in rich collagen, elastin, new blood vessels, and essentially just recreates all of that epithelial layer. It's very dramatic, very effective. And <clears throat> when you think that as many as 50% of women in their menopausal years are suffering from, from changes related to estrogen deficiency, and those symptoms, again, are the vaginal dryness and irritation and discomfort. So <clears throat> the obvious treatment is estrogen replacement. And that works extremely well. But there are those who, for whatever reason, don't use estrogens or can't use estrogens. So there are women who are afraid of using estrogens. They may have a family history of an estrogen-dependent cancer. Um, they themselves may have had uh, an estrogen-dependent breast cancer, thrombophlebitis, which is blood clots, uh, that are triggered in, in a lot of cases by estrogen. And there are other contraindications to estrogen, although unusual. And there are women who use estrogens but don't get an adequate response from them and they're still symptomatic with vaginal atrophy. So the Mona Lisa laser treatments are done in the office they don't require a any anesthesia. It takes about two minutes, literally, to do it. Um, there are no side effects, and there's no downtime. 
So a woman, a woman may come in and have her treatment and be gone and resume full activities. We say, don't insert anything in the vagina for 48 hours, but that's it. It requires three treatments at six week intervals. So by the end of three months, the treatments are complete. Um, and to date, there are thousands of women who have benefited from this. We started using it several years ago and I, you know, I would say women who have breast cancer or breast cancer survivors, uh, it, it, it's amazing what has been done in the advance of our treatments on breast cancer and survivability. But a lot of women feel like, and I, and I get it, like, you know, they go to the doctor and the approach is, we're going to save your life. And they do. But then the quality of life may, be, may take a big hit. And it can be pretty rough. We've had patients who we have seen restored to perfectly normal uh, sexual activity, no discomfort. Uh, it's, it's been dramatic and very gratifying to play a role in and be a part of. So that's pretty much my pitch. Um, in summary, you know, the OBGYNs and urologists all have a, have a piece of this. There's a lot of overlap. Um, but I think that what a urogynecologist has to offer is additional expertise in certain areas, both surgical and non-surgical, especially where previous, previous procedures have failed. Um, I think that urogynecologists are more experienced in treating and correcting problems related to pelvic floor uh, problems, simply because that's all we do, uh, nothing but. And I think as, as a result of that, a urogynecologist is going to be more up to date on latest developments like the Mona Lisa. So that's it. I would love. <laughs> I'd love to entertain any questions. Yes, ma'am. Will insurance cover the Mona Lisa touch? No, that's the problem. <laughs> and you know, I don't know why, uh, because it's, it's getting more and more traction. Um, and I think it's just a matter of the uh, FDA, you know, getting enough information to where they'll finally um, support it. Anyone? Yes, sir. Uh, my question might be off a little bit, but I want to concern I've had from the first time, I'm a grandfather of five granddaughters. And their age is from 10 to 22. In our community, we have a high rate of birth uh, death in our community. Maternal death or? Right. Yeah. Uh, the age is from 16 to 28. My correction, my uh, research tells me, and from there from 28 to 35. Do you have any information as to why that birth rate death is so high in our community as opposed to the European community? I do not. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's. I, I left that world behind me a, a number of years ago. I wish I could help you out, but I'm sure we can get you an answer. Uh, there are other people in this department who specialize in nothing but that, in maternal fetal medicine. Uh, yeah, sure. Yes, ma'am. I have a friend, and she's a name of a very country, and when she was a very young girl, she was subjected to a procedure called female circumcision. 
there's a lot of problems due to that. So. <clears throat> Probably um, me. I don't know. I mean, that can be very complex, and I'm not saying that I would be the one to fix it, but uh, I, I might be able to fix it, but also would be able to do a proper evaluation and then, and then get her connected with the right person that could fix it. Is topical estrogen just as effective as systemic estrogen? Great, yeah, great question. The question was, is topical estrogen as effective as oral or pellets or any number of other ways? The nice thing about vaginal estrogen replacement is that uh, the, and that can be in the form of a cream or a, a suppository in the vagina. And the good thing about it is that it by and large stays localized to that area. So there are estrogen receptors in the vagina, but there are also estrogen receptors in the bladder. And one of the things uh, that we see a lot of, and I didn't talk about today, is, is urinary tract infections and recurrent urinary tract infections, and they can be a real problem. Um, and a lot of that can be helped by replacing vaginal estrogens because the, they, go, they, they also replace the estrogens in the, in the bladder and makes the bladder more uh, resistant to infections. So, so the, when, when given vaginally, the, it's a local effect in the vaginal tissues, the bladder, but it doesn't go beyond that much. I mean, you can, you can detect it in blood tests, but just barely. So most women are not gonna have any systemic effects. You don't have to worry about the effects on breast tissue and, and other tissues in the body. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned earlier about, um, about the overactive bladder and things of that nature, that they had problems going to the, to the bathroom. Uh, is humorous a problem, too, that you see associated with the prolapse? Well, hemorrhoids are much more common with prolapse, and there are a lot of times when we, after we fix the prolapse, the hemorrhoids actually get better. Yeah. I had a question about um, the difference in when, how do you know if you should go to a urologist or a urogynecologist? Should women typically just seek out you or a urologist, and how do you know the difference? It depends on the problem. Um, I would say the majority of, there, there, there are a few exceptions to this, but the large, large majority of urologists are pretty much male-oriented. Um, now, you know, there's Dr. Lori Fleck and Christy Birch that are on faculty at USA now, and they, and they do a lot of female work. Um, I think in the, in the area of prolapse surgery, I'm probably more experienced than they are, um, but, yeah. But, uh, but if someone came to you and it's not due to prolapse, you would refer them, I guess, back to Again, the depending on what the problem is. Depending, yeah. or if you go to a urologist, they might look at it and say, this really is more related to female issues and therefore you right. want to better serve. So right. just kind of There's a lot of crossover uh, there. And you know, they're they're comfortable treating a lot of things that I see and vice versa. But if I you know if I felt uncomfortable and let they, they could do a better job, I'm gonna send it to them. You said something about uh, stress or exercise or could I do some of the surgery. What is a safe way to lift. I have to do a lot of lifting in my job and I do a lot of home repairs. And I had a repair 10 years ago and I'm beginning to wonder if I've undone it. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I, it's, that's a, it's all relative. I mean, it depends on how good the repair is, how much, you, how much you're straining. Um, so there's not an absolute answer there. Um, I, 
I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to give you a, a number. Well, I haven't quit, even though I was told originally after surgery, not the less more than 10 pounds, and I far exceeded that. The last 10 years, I've been doing that. I would never, I mean, you know, after a successful surgery, you ought to be able to do anything you normally would be doing. I just wouldn't, I, I, where I kind of draw the line is if you're straining, if you're really bearing down to strain, then I'd say that's too much. Okay. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, sir. This is off the subject a little bit. I have a good friend who's had problems for quite a while now about urine leaking. So what what can you say about men who have problems? I know prostate is a big problem. Is there anything else or, or what? The, um, Overactive bladder symptoms can affect men too, and they and they they can respond to those medications. Uh, they, you know, the medications fall into two categories. There's an, um, they're the uh, anti anticholinergic medicines like Vesicare and uh, Detrol. There's a bunch of those, and and then there's another medicine called Mirbetric, uh, which ha operates in a different way, but. But bottom line, men can respond favorably if, if that's the problem. If it's the overactive bladder that's the problem, then now if it's prostate related, you know, it can be an overflow problem where the bladder's not empty and it's too full and it's leaking because it's too full. So that requires a ure urologist to evaluate that. Uh, and then of course, men that have had prostate surgery are more prone to have leakage as a result of not having a prostate. But generally a urologist is going to be the way to go with that. Anything else? Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. <laughs>